All right. Good afternoon. I'm going to tell you a story. So um, first, I have to I give the, um, the grateful acknowledgement to Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, who supported the work I'm going to share with you. My name is Ted Smith, and I'm the Chief of Civic Innovation for the city of Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, we are uh, very fortunate to be one of five cities in the United States that Bloomberg Philanthropies selected to help us um, work through how you can innovate in the context of government and the important work that the public sector does. And so I want to share with you a little bit of some deep history and then where we are right now and then hope to get your help on some things that we're facing right at the moment. So just as by way of context, when I came to join um, this mayor and his administration, I started collecting the lists of all the worst things about Louisville, Kentucky, because I had a, a colleague over in our Chamber of Commerce who had a, probably the best list, right? I mean, their job, right? To what, you know, everybody should move to Louisville because your children will all be bright and we're disease free and all that. So that's what chambers do. So we, we sort of looked at this as a great opportunity to push an innovation agenda. And we chose to fish in the part of the barrel that has all the issues. And one of the great things the media likes to report about Louisville, Kentucky, is that it's one of the worst places in the United States to live if you have a breathing disorder. And so we constantly rank in the top five if you have allergies or asthma or COPD, like please stay away, It'll, you know, you'll die immediately upon entering the county <laughs> limits, right? And so um, if you would ask around, ask the health community, um, ask the academics, you know, they would say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's complicated. And actually, I'll tell you, it sounds like something you might read in the Farmer's Almanac. So what's complicated? Oh, we're in the Ohio River Valley, and air gets trapped, and then there's inversions, and there's nothing you can do about it. And really, that's what we've been telling people for a couple of generations. You know, there's really, it's, a, you know, it's a kind of a problem. There's nothing we can do about it because we're in a valley. And so we decided to tackle it, you know, that working at the Farmer's Almanac level probably wasn't good enough. And so we found this little gadget, which is a GPS-enabled uh, asthma inhaler uh, that essentially every time you take a, a puff of a rescue medication, it takes a snapshot of what time it is and where you are. Now, why would we want to do that? Because today, when I read the Weather Channel and it tells me this is such a terrible place to live, they really think that they're talking about 350 square miles or about... 200 cubic miles of air is sort of the way they are you know, rounding us. And so at the end of the day, if you distribute 500 of these inhalers over an 18-month period, you may have the opportunity to capture 7,000 emergency rescue inhaler attacks. And so if you can think about the great history in public health of uh, discovering uh, what happens when you have a tainted well in a city, it wasn't really the entire city of London that was on trial. The only way to solve the problem was to reduce the scale and increase the resolution for sampling. And so there you have um, a heat map of these 7,000 attacks. And so we're not talking about 350 uh, uh, square miles. We're talking about uh, an area that is probably more like 50 square miles, OK? And so that's a starting point. That actually made us ask, well, what do we know about things like air? Because when you look at a map like that, you, you kind of, well, what's special about these places? By the way, let's not get into the methodology, but balanced recruiting across the entire geography. If you map these attacks for where people live, the correlation is 0.2. So it ain't where you live, and it isn't about having dust mites that leave droppings that don't smell good for you or whatever. So we said, hey, what's going on with the air? And uh, we met these things, right? So every community's got a bunch of them. They cost $250,000, sometimes more, sometimes a little less. Um, you can't have one right at the end of your street. You can't have one at your school or your playground. You get them wherever we decided a long time ago to put them. And they all generally measure a different constellation of important indicators in the air. And so when we take a look at those things, and on this map, there are blue dots that are overlaid over the heat map. Sometimes it works out pretty well. Like there's one that's right by one of our, um, uh, our uh, civil aviation uh, airports, which is handy, and so we can look at that. And then there's some that are actually um, positioned west of our industrial corridor. So they get all the air as it rolls off the countryside of Indiana before it meets the stationary stacks of our industrial corridor. So that's what we get from those. So our air quality is determined by these stations, five of them. Okay. And we found out that looking at that data, there's so much variability 
moment to moment, place to place, that it's hard to feel like we're really capturing what's going on with air quality if it's an environmental determinant of health. So we decided, that better not be a warning, Beth. We decided to go sh uh, shopping in the discount bin, and we found these great $200 air sensors called the Air Quality Egg. Well, they're not that great because we're busy ripping a lot of chips off them, and they're Arduino boards with a plastic shell. But we can cost-effectively buy good enough sensors to put in these things. So we're deploying 100 of those low-cost sensors all over that area to give us better spatial resolution. And so we're working through the sort of science of it. I was at the EPA labs in North Carolina earlier this week to go through kind of how we reconcile cheap, cheap sensors and expensive sensors. But you're still left um, wondering about areas that you're not going to place things. And so this is where citizen science comes in. So we're just about to embark on bicycle-mounted sensors, ultimately personal sensors for some clinical populations. And we'll be biking around um, our merged city county. And uh, we'll be looking specifically at those areas where we've seen epidemiological evidence that there could be some concerns. And then we'll be looking at control areas. And it will be a project that requires us to engage with the public. And um, this is a really tough moment in the Geeks Walks uh, scenario because you know, the public sector has a responsibility you know, to communicate uh, with certainty and confidence and quality assurance the information about for example, the quality of your water, the quality of your air. And so as citizens get involved in monitoring air, as other devices enter the mix and there's new kinds of data streams, there are legitimate questions about how we manage that um, activity. I like the phrase citizen science because we're not suddenly dubbing you know, a couple hundred thousand people as scientists to then mix around and confuse with people who spend a lot of time in graduate school. So it'd be important to know that there's a role for different actors in the system, but, um, but, they, but it needs to be defined, how that interface works. How should we know? Should there be training? Uh, should, uh, sh should somebody uh, demonstrate that they've tested or calibrated a device? I mean, these are sort of very simple questions. Should they be helping us find other information that electronic devices can't find? All good questions, all questions that nobody has great answers for at the moment, and we're very hungry for uh, those answers. So I will, if I have any time left, there was a dog barking at me earlier, I will answer questions. Questions. All right. What are you going to be able to do about it once you understand the where? That is a fantastic question. So it's interesting. You sit down with a, a funder like Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. You know They've been spending a lot of time and energy trying to make America healthier and other parts of the world, I guess. Um, the real question is, can public policy ever be informed by work like this? Because if you look at, for example, in our community, we spend an awful lot of time and money focusing on things like green infrastructure, lane restrictions, traffic calming. Often, you know, the reason for doing that kind of work is to say, oh, well, it makes people healthier. Like, oh, they're going to bike more, and they're, you know, green infrastructure is good, it'll clean the air. But you know, no city in the world that I'm familiar with is actually working hard to close between the loop between health indicators and interventions. And so, you could be in a position, since I know that 10% of those people that had an emergency attack also ended up in the emergency room, and I know that for a fact, then we can start to build the case, right? So 4,000 bucks in admission, you know, can I reduce by 20% the number of ER admissions? This is the work that needs to be done. So it's not just a sort of boil the ocean, let's figure out what we can learn about the air. It, it definitely has an eye towards if I can get the spatial resolution up, I can get to tighter territories to work in, and then we can look for interventions, whether they're public policy interventions, whether they're infrastructure investments, whatever they might be. They might even just be guidance to the clinical pathway. I mean, today, more physicians ask in Louisville, where do you live, than they did five years ago. And so that itself is probably a good thing, right? So two things. One, one is, uh, it sounds like you're, you're asking for advice on how to motivate the citizen scientists. Or how to uh, manage or how their to manage role them. and okay. motivate. On, on the motivation, I would just say, you know, a big thing is, is they want to know that they're making a difference. So 
feedback mechanisms that make it clear that something happened with what they did. Uh, what are the things that, that you want to direct them on? Are you trying to, what, I mean, what do you need from them other than doing their normal activities? Do you need them to calibrate the sensors? Do you need them to go visit places that they wouldn't otherwise have, have visited? That's, it's not clear to me yet what it is that you need them to do. Yeah, so we have no shortage of the interested people. We, we have this issue to manage, which is they're not as well trained as the people that do this professionally, right? And so they're eager to you know, deploy and measure and count things, um, but we sort of have to balance the, um, we, we have to figure out ways to get them a level of participation that they can feel good about their own and excited about their own role without letting sort of that get out of control. And so, for example, the 100 eggs, they were all bought $200 at a time by people who adopted them in our community. So that's a crazy level of just sort of civic engagement. But we, you know, then we need to manage the, but now you're not a miniature you know, astrophysicist, right? So I'd love to pursue that a little further with you. Thank you. All right, thank you.